Welcome everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about the strength of the U.S. housing market and what to look for in spring 2024. We may have just gotten back from Gathering of Eagles, but we're not done with events for 2023 yet. This October, we're headed right back to Austin, Texas for Housing Wire Annual, and we want to see you there. We've got a power-packed agenda with content such as our Women of Influence speakers, peak performer playbooks, CEO playbooks, and more to propel your company forward, as well as a bunch of networking events. Because this event is open to real estate executives, mortgage title, and everyone in between, you really have the opportunity to network with people from all across the housing ecosystem. If you want to learn more about the event, or if you're already ready to get registered, head over to housingwire.com on the events tab and you can learn all about it. Not to mention, if you're an HW Plus member, you're going to get 50% off your ticket. So get registered for HW Plus and get registered for the event so we can see you out in Austin. Logan, welcome back to the podcast. It is wonderful to be here, Sarah. And I just want to say that the U.S. housing market is the world envy of housing markets around the world. So we need to explain why we need to be very uh, uh, happy here compared to what other countries have to deal with right now. Okay. So tell me why that's the topic today. Like why, why are we talking about that right now? You know, there's discussions of loan modifications in Canada to 60, 80, 90 year mortgages, um, recast payments in, you know, other countries, Australia, Norway, Sweden, you know, um, our, our U S housing market has held firm and, you know, Today, uh, the Michigan Consumer uh, Confidence Index had a big spike. And, you know, I hearken back to, you know, in 2008, when home sales were uh, just as low as we are right now for the existing home sales market. But back then, people were filing for foreclosures, bankruptcies. Uh, You know, we didn't have the, you know, uh, the buyer profile like we did back then. So there was all these things that were terrible back in 2008 before the recession even started and we sit here today you know having this economy still expand even with inflation and all these rate hikes but the housing market itself just to credit the homeowners uh uh it you know you know the whole making sure the forbearance crash bros paid the price of uh of a, of a, of a terrible premise uh we see this today now that homeowners are just in a good spot and the last and the only thing we need left is for mortgage rates to come back down for the existing home sales market to get more uh, demand volume. But uh, it really shows how unique we are as a country, uh, um, even compared to back in 2008 period, but just around the world right now and the stress that uh, uh, other countries have with their short-term mortgage rate products. And we have the mother Godzilla of them all, the 30-year fixed mortgage. The 30 year fix. So even though you have labeled this market savagely unhealthy and the people who are in it feel that way for sure, in your opinion, it still could be much worse? Oh, it could be terribly worse. It could be a hundred times worse than what it is right now. The the savagely unhealthy housing market was a, a premise of too many people chasing too few homes, right? And the days on market get below. Now, it's one thing when this was happening when existing home sales were 6.5 million, but you really get to test the 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 premise when you have the biggest collapse in home sales ever, and we're still here, right? That was the whole uh, trying to convince people that this was a supply issue. Again, first world problems in the sense that homeowners are doing well, but it does propose a problem when home prices escalate out of control because there's not enough product out there. So that, in a sense, is is still here, but on the credit side, it's beautiful, right? You know, all these... Uh, live uh, um, presentations I give uh, at events. I Whenever I look at those credit charts, I go, isn't that the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? That is just gorgeous. Look at it. You know, just take a look at that. Everybody get your phones out, take pictures of that. That, you know, and, and how I lead it is when anybody tells me it's housing 2008, show that chart and go, no, it never can. It mathematically cannot be housing 2008. You can make a case, maybe it's 2005. And then four years later, we have a credit stress buildup, but it definitely was never 2008. And a lot of that has to do with credit channels. 
Yes. At our Gathering of Eagles event, afterwards, someone, we were joking about like, uh, find yourself someone who looks at you the way Logan looks at that chart. <laughs> because Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's just love, love, love. That's awesome. Okay, so where do we go from here, though? Because, I mean, yes, things are better than they are in a lot of other places, better than they could be, but still really rough. Here, you know, you know again, for, for me, it's, we saw housing demand noticeably actually pick up November, December, January, up until the first week of February, but that needed low mortgage rates. And that's always kind of been my, my, my premise that to get a material change in the existing home sales market, because again, demand is 21st century lows. You could make a case all time lows. If you take the total workforce of over 156 million, uh, sales are very low, but affordability is an issue, right? That doesn't magically fix itself. Uh, you either have to have wages grow over time or mortgage rates fall. But we did see, you know, when, when mortgage rates did fall, demand did pick up. Uh, um, and of course, we're dealing with, uh, uh, well, I, I would say we, we're dealing with inflation, but the growth rate of inflation is falling, Fed Governor Waller. And uh, um, progress is being made there. And if the spreads just get normal, the spreads between the 10-year yield and 30-year mortgage rates, you get down to 5.5% uh, on mortgage rates, boy, the, the, we, we are talking about a different market. And uh, we saw a glimpse of that happen. Uh, and this is why I was critical of uh, Fred President uh, Kashkari when he came on TV and said, 6% mortgage rates, uh-oh, uh-oh, that's, that's not good. That's not good for our jobs. Listen, you want that job, make it good, right? Find a way to, to talk about housing in a more efficient way. Uh, people buying homes, people having sex, having kids, building up their, 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 their family um, uh, foundation is that's that's what America was about. So uh, if the growth rate of inflation is falling noticeably, and in some cases negative year over year, final goods pr producer price index went negative. Yes, the last four times that did occur were three recessions and one manufacturing recession. You don't have to talk like this anymore. No, that's good. Okay, so let's look a little bit farther out. And I know it seems early, but it is the middle of July. Let's talk about spring 2024 or what you think is going to happen in 2024. Yes. And I am very excited about this because this is, you know, something we, uh, we have talked about in a, in a podcast earlier. We have a very abnormal housing market in the sense that the spring inventory does not grow at its normal time frame. Um, it, Traditionally, we see the bottom, you know, early January, maybe close to the bottom in February. And then we see this natural increase in active uh, supply uh, because it's the spring buying year. Well, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023 were abnormal. Now, I would say in uh, 2020, before COVID hit us, we did have the natural uh, increase in, in, in listings. And then, of course, COVID threw everything in disarray. But 2021, we didn't have it. What I would argue is that the COVID-19 recovery pushed demand toward the end of the year and it pushed out the seasonal bottom back then. In 2022, it was uh, uh, extremely strange because toward the end of 2021, we had a volume surge in, in purchase application data, which is extremely abnormal. But even last year, you know, toward the end of 2022, we saw uh, uh, November, December, January forward looking purchase application data got better. It wasn't like any, anything spectacular, but it was enough to force the active listings, the seasonal bottom to happen at the uh, longest time ever recorded in history. It was April 14th. So I am really curious to see what happens in 2024, uh, um, this would be almost, in a sense, a the fifth year, the last year of my economic model work, actually. Uh, and can we get just traditional active listings? I'm a very pro supply person. I believe when there's enough supply and people have choices, you know, that's the best kind of marketplace. I am not a fan; have not been a fan of this market for for some time because we just don't have enough choices. So I'm hoping to see if purchase application data does get better let's say October, November, December, does that again push out the forward uh, uh, seasonal bottom in inventory? And then we're just kind of stuck here, right? Because if demand gets better, because there is no mortgage rate lockdown, 
uh, supply doesn't have the ability to grow. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, we're kind of still stuck in this, uh, problematic housing market, but I, I think that, you, you know, eventually that either becomes a natural process of things, or, uh, we see a year where we could get the active listings to grow, uh, in, in a normal fashion. And that'll be a huge positive in my eye. Huge positive. And what do you think about, you know, you mentioned the last two years, November, December, we had purchase apps tick up. And we could even see like this fall, because we really never had the spring buying season that we would have expected. Does that mean we're going to have a better fall buying season? Well, it, it you know, if mortgage rates head back towards 6% or, or if they go lower, absolutely. I mean, what we've seen this year, so year to date, uh, let's just take November 2022 out of the equation. We have more positive weekly prints than negative. You know, 14 positive, 12 negative. That's how I look at it, making some holiday adjustments. So uh, in a sense, we don't have any clear direction. But if we have a repeat where mortgage rates head down towards six and go even below that, um, that can create positive purchase application data with duration. Like we saw November 9th all the way to the first week of February. And that gave us one of the biggest uh, existing home sales prints ever in history. We had almost 600,000 homes bought in one month. That extremely abnormal. There was a lot of uh, uh, homes that just closed that month. So we actually do see this uh, uh, being a possibility because we tested it. Not like 10 years ago, we tested it uh, uh, late last year. So it really depends on rates. And again, rates matter. Rates matter going up. Rates matter down. A lot of the positive purchase app data we've seen have come with lower rates coming the week before. A lot of the negative data we've seen have come with higher rates, but definitely, definitely considering how low existing home sales in, you get you get you get mortgage rates that starts moving down and staying low, not going back and forth. You got something to work with. Uh, uh, we got a taste of that, and because existing home sales are so low. Uh, it, again, it's a very low bar. I always say it's you know such a low bar we could all trip over it, but uh, that gives us an ability to get a bounce. But again, it all depends on rates and duration, and uh, uh, we're still kind of in the high sixes, not uh, low sixes or the fives. You know, high sixes is better than sevens. We can we can take our win there. But I guess the question I have is, what's changed? You know, you and I talk on this podcast every couple of days. What's changed since the last time we talked about, you know, are we still expecting two more hikes? Our favorite Governor Waller has come in and go, two more rate hikes, and then maybe another one, you know? Um, and that, was this, that was this week. We're, we're filming yeah, that was this that. week. Uh, right. So yeah. every there's always a good, ba good cop, bad cop in every relationship. I mean, clearly you're the bad cop in this one. Um, but <laughs> uh, with Fed Governor Waller, uh, you know, I think, you know, his views is, you know, you know, if any Fed member says like, there's no progress in inflation, like now I'm just, now I'm just making fun of him. Now it was just like, you know, it's just like take, is going to the country fair and dunking the clown into the, into the water. Um, there's progress made. There's noticeable progress made. Uh, uh, if you actually take real time rents, the core inflation looks much lower. So you can't use that line anymore. And at a point right now, first of all, the last three, the last three rate hikes you didn't need to do. And if you're talking about two more, then some more, okay, you're, you are now 100% targeting the labor market because real yields are up. There's, there's no need to do anything anymore, right? There's no need to do the last three ones. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping as a country, everyone's, starts pushing back on the Fed because th these things that the whole inflation accelerating out of control last year, it didn't happen. Wage growth is cooling down. There's a point where advantage, disadvantage, you're not, you're not gaining anything anymore by talking tough, right? Just let, land the plane, let it go. And the whole point of the Fed being so aggressive early on was hoping they could just get to a level and stop. Right, it isn't constantly saying, "Oh my God, people are people are are making money." No, no, no. You you start to sound desperate, right? Uh, uh, that any kind of growth is inflationary, and that's bad. Somebody getting a raise, that's bad. No, the growth rate of inflation is falling. 
the PPI data has just collapsed. And uh, not only is it back to pre-COVID levels, the finished good process is negative. Again, when that data line has gone negative, we're either in a recession or the manufacturing sector is in a recession. So there is progress being made. You don't need to do this anymore. And this is why every time I hear President Logan did the same thing, Waller said, we are going to push back on the Fed all the time at this point. There's no need to talk about this. And if mortgage rates go down to 6% and people buy homes, you don't need to panic. Like, really, do you really want a job like that if you if people are buying homes, you're going to start to panic? No, come on. So there, there's a point where I understand about talking tough, but the whole idea of spiking rates as fast as you were was to get to a point and stop so you don't have to cut them. So we don't have a job loss recession. And hopefully now all the work that's been seen in the last year, the people that have advocated for unemployment rates of seven and a half percent for two years or over five and a half percent for four, whatever it is, it didn't, you didn't need to do it. Right. And that's been our main mantra here uh, at housing wire. You do not need to uh, uh, create a job loss recession for global pandemic uh, inflation. This is not the 1970s. And uh, it's not going to be the 1970s. You let the supply portion of it come back and you don't need to force a job loss recession. Well, especially if, if, you know, housing has been in a recession for more than a year. If you now see that manufacturing is going into a recession, you know, those are those two account for a giant part of the economy. So what else would they be looking for? Well, you know, the, there's a lot of manufacturing investment going on right now. So that investment, in a sense, will help productivity and help supply. Um, so that's a that's a positive. The price is falling as much as it has, right? You know, the, the finished goods. It's just the, the whole inflationary, deflationary. It's like the freight costs, you know, during COVID-19 went from like 2000 to 16,000. Now it's back to 2000. I mean, some of these things are just historical global pandemic supply uh, issue uh, problems. And, you know, there's progress made. Right. You don't you don't have to just keep on talking negative, negative, negative and just we need to hike. We need there's we have to move on with our our lives. And uh, hopefully some of the Fed members realize that their job is not to just keep on talking tough when progress is made. Uh, um, and then I think it gets into the point of attacking labor. Really, do you really need do you really want to be those people who said we need seven and a half percent unemployment? No, you don't want that badge. Uh, on your grave, right? So I think I think that at this stage we just move forward on, and if rates do fall, right, you don't need to panic anymore. Man, rates need to fall. So okay, let's talk about inventory. We're going to get inventory numbers by the time this podcast comes out. You will know what the inventory is. The tracker will be out, which tracks inventory, purchase apps, uh, and and mortgage rates. What do you expect to see? So new listings data has now entered a phase where it would be doing its seasonal decline. So for me, it's, it's, I want to see, do we actually create a very aggressive downturn uh, in the seasonal data or does it kind of slowly go lower uh, um, because we're working from all time lows, right? I think uh, uh, last year was, was noticeable because we actually saw some year over year growth in the new listings data uh, uh, toward the middle of the year. And then all of a sudden, like, Rates got above six percent, and then you know we we saw a year over year decline, and then the seasonal decline is as well. Here, we I mean it's been twelve months we've been trending at the lowest levels of new listings ever recorded in history, and I I always like to explain people. All, I deal with housing crash people all the time, and they keep on saying a massive supplies, and I say basic knowledge. If you would need to, for if you're believing in the massive supply, you will catch it in the new listings data. Okay. It'll, it, it, it just can't magically appear. This is not a, a rabbit coming out of a hat, right? You will be able to see it. It will string itself out for two years, most likely. Um, but it wasn't the last 12 months. And this is why we always emphasize reading is a good thing. And the history of human civilization has taught, taught us that, you know, uh, those who don't read just don't have the, the ability to uh, digest information, factual information, and then, you know, present a case for it. And 12 months, right? 12 months, new listings data is trending at the lowest levels ever recorded history. We'll see, you know, how it looks like in the last uh, six months of the year, but I'm hoping that it, you know, 
we don't see any kind of uh, a bigger uh, collapse and just kind of get to a really low level. And then hopefully we could bounce up higher uh, in 2024. Active listings, of course, is has gone negative year over year and um, purchase application data has still had more positive prints. So the velocity of inventory uh, uh, escalating out of control, not here. I mean, it's the, it's literally the walking dead, Sarah. I mean, I, I mean when, I, when I went on CNBC on May 15th and I was trying to explain to the anchor, the, even though the anchor said, well, it's the year over year percentage is high. Yeah, we were working from the lowest levels ever recorded history. There's no real growth here. And uh, now that we're in you know mid part of July, uh, again, it's crazy to say this, but active inventory is down year over year. The slope of last year was very abnormal uh, just because last year was the biggest home sale crash ever. So active listings was able to grow because higher mortgage rates, active listings grow that way, Sarah Wheeler. And uh, in this case, uh, um, we don't have that because we don't have the negative purchase application data anymore. And that's why I always stress, you go back to November 9th, and you take all the housing data from November 9th and where we are today, um, and then then it makes sense, right? Everything makes sense because the forward-looking data started to go uh, positive. That means the biggest collapse we've seen in in history uh, in housing uh, reverse. And and I and I always like to revert back to you know what I talked about two years ago that everything's going to be a little bit tricky and harder these days because we're dealing with very high velocity data. The bullwhip of these you know, global pandemics and these economic data lines are so extreme. Uh, we didn't have to deal with that in the previous expansion. Uh, so, so slow data is very easy to track. High velocity data, I mean, we had a housing recession on June 16th, 5.01 p.m. And then from November 9th, the builder's confidence index went negative from a waterfall collapse now to positive. Not really normal, but it happened. And that's why you have to track data daily, weekly, monthly, because things move so fast these days that you don't want to be the economist coming in July and go, home prices are still going to fall 20% because prices follow sales and sales collapse. Dude, that you're, 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 you're still stuck a year ago. All right. The data's changed. So go with it. You know, one of the data lines that you uh, have pointed out multiple times since it happened was and and one of the reasons that the spreads between the ten year yield and the thirty year mortgage rates have gotten so crazy this year is the is the banking crisis right which kicked off with s v b I think that was the first one there might have been a small one before that yeah at the it's... same time so my my question to you is at what point does that stop affecting you know what we're seeing right now like i, I mean that it doesn't seem like more banks are are you know in that in that uh, domino effect so if it, it... If the spreads get down to 2.60, which was we were heading down that way, it's 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 still above three percent here. Um, I, you, you know, we're we're making progress. We were making good progress uh, before the banking crisis. But to me, when I when I when I look at spreads getting bad, it's usually a recession, right? It's usually there's financial stress uh, uh, in the marketplace, um, and you know, last year at this time, so many CEOs were were bearish because their CFOs were trying to track business spendings and all they hear about is inflation, recession, and all of a sudden they're like, uh, people are still working, you know? Um, right. So uh, it, it, it was abnormal to, to, to see the spreads get uh, that bad that fast. But if you look at history, the, the only other time that the spreads were worse were the recession in 1980 to 1982. So uh, the question now is, and, and we'll, we'll see this, does, does the spreads get better when the Fed cries uncle and goes, we're done hiking, okay, the next thing will be a cut. And then we, we start to get back toward an, an, uh, another area just because people, you know, people tell me, well, spreads get worse in a recession, so we haven't even seen the worst of it yet. And every, okay, hypothetically, that's, that's correct. You, the spreads could get worse in a recession, but we've already had a historical uh, move already. Uh, um, and we've had historical uh, uh, moves in the sense the Michigan Consumer Confidence Index today is up four month high. Last year, it was at the lowest levels in the 21st century, right? Even lower than COVID, it was lower than the great financial crisis. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, emotions can be tilted, which, which, you, uh, uh, which you believe to be the case happening, but it doesn't 
mean that the reality of it. So when 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 the Fed cries uncle and says, okay, we're done, and then the market starts to really believe that, you know, it should just because the spreads are already bad and, and we were heading toward a better area. That's that's what I want to see because as of right now, the banking crisis is still uh, mess things up. And to me, the the spreads are still saying the recession is coming. So we're just going to keep high here. So that's what I'm uh, uh, waiting for to see. How do the spreads react when the Fed finally says, that's it, we're done? This has been a crazy year. It's why we launched the tracker. And I wanted to give a shout out here for Housing Wire Annual, which is coming up in October because you will be one of our headliners. You will be walking us through this. Also, you and I will be doing a live podcast and with the audience. So um, on the last day, you and I are going to do what we do right here. Only people can be in the audience. They can ask questions in real time. I know you'll stick around afterwards and, and talk to people specifically. So I, I really wanted to call that out because we've put together an amazing lineup of speakers and agenda so that people can get the answers they need. So let me go through that really quick. Logan, we have Sandra Thompson, obviously the director of the FHFA. We have a ton of mortgage execs from Sierra Pacific Mortgage, from uh, New Res. We've got Loan Depot, All Western uh, Mortgage. We have uh, Revolution Mortgage, Car Cardinal Financial, Atlantic Bay Mortgage. We've got Class Valuation, which is obviously appraisal. We have Thousand Watt, we have Coldwell Banker, we have American Pacific Mortgage, U Mortgage, Panorama Mortgage, Black Knight, US Bank. I mean, we, we just have so many, I can't even like keep going through there. And our whole goal- It looks like a big audience to see me actually destroy the mortgage rate lockdown live, <laughs> you know, when okay, we talk. We so I, 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 I uh, it'll- yeah, definitely for sure. Well, I could finally can, end this us, debate once they can and for all. See us debate this. They're not going to see you end it because that would that's not going to happen. But truly, like I would just encourage our listeners, come. You're gonna you're gonna get so much. You're gonna get a lot of Logan. Mike Simonson's going to be speaking. So I feel like between you and Mike, we have a, a great part of the housing market covered and and what we can expect the rest of this year in 2024. Yes, the live presentations have gone very well, and uh, I plan on making this one the best one. Uh, so it's going to be very special for uh, for Housing Wire Annual, for sure. Yes, so come and meet us in person, um, be in our audience in person, and enjoy all of the amazing speakers we have. So Logan, thank you so much for being on today, walking us through what's going on, and I'll talk to you again in a few days. Pleasure is always mine, Sarah.